The Jurassic was one of the most prolific times in our planet's history. This part of the Mesozoic was one of the peak times to be a dinosaur. And in the latter days of the Jurassic, one location here in North America was teeming with life. This was none other than the Morrison Formation. To this day, the Morrison is one of the richest fossil beds in North America and has been responsible for bringing multiple species of dinosaurs to the attention of both scientists and the public. Here alone, more than 35 valid species of dinosaurs have been discovered, over hundreds of fossil finds. Aside from the dinosaurs, there was a multitude of fish, plants, reptiles, and mammals that populated this location. But before we really dive into the fauna of this location, let's talk about the Morrison itself for a bit. This locale dates back to about 156 to about 146 million years ago. It's primarily made up of mudstone, sandstone, siltstone, and limestone, with fossils being far more common in the silt and sandstone. Because the rocks of the Morrison span over 10 million years, many of the species I'm going to talk about today didn't actually coexist with one another, but every creature in this video was found in the Morrison. The Morrison is a huge locale, spanning over 600,000 square miles, or about 1.5 million square kilometers. However, a large part of the Morrison is still buried underground, and part of it was destroyed when the Rocky Mountains first arose around 55 million to 80 million years ago. And while this leaves scientists with only part of the data, it's still enough to show us an impressive set of fauna and flora. Now, I'll be honest, when it comes to flora or plants, they're not my speciality, but the Morrison makes it kinda easy for me. The Morrison was rich with plant life, and the most striking of these were probably the giant conifer trees. These conifers are thought to have been enormous, much larger than today, and would have possibly reached the size of modern redwoods. These massive trees would not only provide food, but also shelter to other plants and animals in their shade. Many people have often wondered how the Morrison could host such a large variety of huge animals like different types of sauropods, and often the answer is simpler than you think. Many plant species covered a much wider area than today and were much larger than they are today, and because of that it provided these animals with far more food. You see, at this period in time, grasses and other flowering plants hadn't begun to evolve yet, so other plants had to fill those roles. Plants like cycads, natals, ferns, and ginkgos would have been the dominant species aside from conifers. This abundant plant life formed the basis of the ecosystem, and they managed to survive despite relatively harsh climates. You see, at this point in time, North America was much farther south than it is today, and the temperatures were arid, humid, and hot. It seemed this locale would go through seasonal rainfall, with distinct wet and dry seasons similar to parts of modern-day Africa. Large rivers would cut swaths through the land, and the lakes would likely rise and shrink seasonally. Large floodplains along with savannas made entirely out of ferns instead of grasses, and large forests compact with different types of plant life comprise most of the ecosystem. After the dry season, which was undoubtedly the toughest on the life here, the rains would return and temporarily create a flood-like stake, reinvigorating the landscape. This type of weather would be both a blessing and a curse for animals large and small. And speaking of small animals, the Morrison is host to some insects. While there is little fossil evidence of insects themselves, scattered fossilized wings are present in several locations, and we do also have a system of eusocial insect nests in what is modern-day Utah. But, unfortunately for all my insect lovers out there, bugs are one of the rare sights here in the Morrison. Despite the lack of water in the dry season, multiple species of fish still called this place home. Several species of lungfish lived here, and these are hardy animals, able to force themselves into hibernation when water is less abundant. This dormancy allows the lungfish to survive without water until it returns in the flood. Most lungfish are relatively small, but some species like the Morrison's very own Ceratodus were massive, reaching upwards of 2 meters in length and weighing nearly 100 pounds. Two small, relatively uncommon fish are Huletia and Morolepis, but they weren't very common. However, the Morrison did have one more standout fish in Leptolepis. Leptolepis is a ray-finned or teleost fish, which makes it far more advanced than most of the other fish in the Morrison. Because of their more advanced adaptations, they may have been slightly more successful than other fish in the Morrison. The fish, however, did have to share the waters with another group, the amphibians. Amphibians are not a common sight in this locale, but they're not entirely absent. Small frogs like Radinosteus and Aenea batrachis lived here, likely feeding on the aforementioned insects. A small basal salamandroid named Eridotriton lived here as well. These animals seem to be fairly basal and lack the traits of their more advanced relatives today. However, like all amphibians, they would have made a brilliant and colorful addition to the landscape. Closely related to the amphibians are the reptiles, and they are among the most prolific animals in the Morrison alongside the dinosaurs. This included several sphenodont reptiles. 
Sphenodonts are part of a group known as Rhinocephalia, which today only has a single living member, the Tuatara. There are many scattered Sphenodont remains in the Morrison, with only a few having an actually assigned species. This includes the Ilenodon, or the better known Opisthia mimus. Sphenodonts were one of the reptile groups in the Morrison, but they also shared it with the squamates. When most people think of the word reptile, squamates are what comes to mind, as most snake and lizard species fall into this group. In the Jurassic, squamates were still an extremely diverse group, just like today. These include some of the oldest species of anguimorph lizard, the Dorsetti saurus. The anguimorpha are often referred to as legless lizards, and they're very insectivorous. But they weren't the only lizards here either. Syncomorph lizards, otherwise known as skinks, also opted to live here. This includes the skink known as Cyrilodon, which can also be found in Jurassic fossil sites all around Europe, as well as a blunt-toothed skink known as Paramacellotus. The final member of the squamata here in the Morrison is an early and basal snake known as Diablophus. However, despite us knowing that the snake exists, we don't know too much about it because it's an extremely fragmentary specimen. Another famous group of reptiles here in the Morrison is, of course, the turtles. The most common of these turtles would have been one called Glyptops, a mid-sized turtle that seemed to have adaptations to suction feeding. This meant that like snapping turtles, it likely ate fish or other aquatic creatures. The turtles, like many of the other species, also have many fragmentary remains, so while there may be plenty of others, we don't know much about them. The last group of reptiles we'll discuss from the Morrison are the Kurotarsans, otherwise known as crocodiles. There are several types of crocodilomorphs here in the Morrison, including two species of Mesosuchians that were adapted to running on land. These are Frutichampsa and Halopus. These two species did not get very large, but they had relatively long legs that would allow them to run effectively on land and spend more time out of the water. They likely mostly ate small animals like mammals and reptiles, but they may have also raided nests alongside them. Given the fact that they lived alongside dinosaurs many times their size, the eggs that those dinosaurs produced would be a much needed protein source. If they could get away with it, that is. More advanced crocodilians like the 10 foot long Diplosaurus also existed here, using the croc's tried and true tactic of underwater ambush. This would allow them to hunt animals even up to the size of small dinosaurs. Many folks seem to think that mammals were not very common in the Morrison, and while it's true that they didn't shine as brightly as the dinosaurs they shared the land with, they were more than abundant. During the Jurassic, a group of mammals known as Cynodonts began to diversify and occupy an incredibly wide variety of niches across the ecosystem. One of these groups were the very rodent-like multi-tubercles. Multi-tubercles were a rather wide group consisting of several species like Priacodon and Tenacidon. These small mammals likely fed similar to rodents today on the most readily available meat and plants, and as generalists, it would make life for them far easier. A group known as Eutriconodonts also flourished during this time, becoming small carnivores. These mammals took on a wide variety of forms, from sleek and small to chunky and burly, and they all shared one trait in common, however, and that was fang-like teeth. Those teeth are distinctive of a predator, and because almost all Eutriconodonts are found with it, it's assumed that they're all carnivores. Another family of mammals known as Dryolestoids were also present here. Not too much is known about them, and they're known mostly from teeth and scattered jawbones. Dryolestoids are notable because they're one of the earliest mammals to develop what would become the modern-day jaw structure of mammals, down to the enamel-coated teeth. And there is one last fairly interesting mammal here in the Morrison. This is Fruta Fossair, a small, squirrel-sized mammal. These little guys were unique in that they had a diet similar to an anteater or armadillo, where they ate mostly small, eusocial insects like termites. Many folks had originally assumed that they were perhaps related to anteaters or armadillos, but that's shown that they weren't. However, as of right now, their classification is still up in the air, so we aren't entirely sure where they belong. But honestly, this just shows how diverse mammals were, even all the way back then. Pterosaurs are not a common sight in the Morrison, but not because they weren't present. The Morrison was a harsh location, and as I'm sure you've guessed by now based on the other animals, it didn't preserve small fossils well. Most of the pterosaurs in the Morrison, because of this, are fragmentary and hard to identify. However, two relatively large species have been identified. The first of these is Harpactognathus, a Ramphoranchid pterosaur. These were relatively large pterosaurs, with a wingspan of over two and a half meters, or about eight feet. Like their European cousin Ramphorhynchus, these guys were likely piscivorous, mainly feeding on small fish. Though they may have had some competition from the other pterosaur in the Morrison, a pterodactyloid named Kepodactylus. However, a skull has never been found for Kepodactylus, so we're not entirely sure what its diet was like. And while we don't know much about the Morrison's pterosaurs, the same cannot be said about its dinosaurs. 
Dinosaurs are the biggest draw of the Morrison Formation, and we found more dinosaur fossils here than any other locale in North America. So let's dive right in, starting with the Ornithischians. This is an extremely diverse group of animals, ranging from the small and diminutive Dryosaurus to the large and plate-backed Stegosaurids. On average, the smallest of these animals were the Neo-Ornithischians, like Dryosaurus, Nanosaurus, and Camptosaurus. Dryosaurus and Nanosaurus, like most Neo-Ornithischians, are relatively small, with Dryosaurus only reaching about 10 feet or 3 meters in length, and Nanosaurus only reaching just under 2. These two species are incredibly long-legged and were likely very fast and agile animals capable of outrunning most predators. However, their relative, the Camptosaurus, was definitely not the same. Camptosaurus was much larger than its cousins, reaching up to 26 feet or around 8 meters in length and weighing nearly a ton. While they still would have been faster than most of the theropods, they're definitely slower than their cousins, which would have made them take a different niche. It seems likely that they may have taken a role similar to what hadrosaurs would do during the Cretaceous. Which does make sense, given that they're actually fairly closely related. These animals would have made a staple prey species, especially amongst the smaller and more nimble carnivores, or those well adapted to ambush hunting. On the opposite end of the Ornithischians, you have the Thyreoforms, the group that includes Ankylosaurs and Stegosaurids. Undoubtedly, one of the most famous Thyreoforms is Stegosaurus itself, and it actually happens to live right here in the Morrison. Stegosaurus was comprised of three separate species, with the smallest of them reaching about 6.5 meters or 21 feet in length, and the largest species reaching upwards of 7.5 meters or 25 feet in length. Stegosaurus was a far tankier dinosaur, being incredibly heavy compared to similar sized animals. In fact, the big species could weigh over 5 tons. Stegosaurus is mostly famous for two things, its large dermal plates and also its deadly thagomizer, consisting of four 2-foot-long spikes. This is because despite being such a large dinosaur, Stegosaurus still had predators, even with all these defenses. However, you may be surprised to know that Stegosaurus wasn't the only Stegosaurid in the Morrison. Two other species, Hesperosaurus and Alcovasaurus, also lived here. Both of these animals are not too much smaller than Stegosaurus itself, reaching about the same size as the smaller version of Stegosaurus. But they do have some notable differences from their far more famous cousin. Hesperosaurus, for example, had plates that were far more low and rounded in comparison to Stegosaurus, far more likely for display rather than defense. However, Alcovasaurus is where the real differences shine. Alcovasaurus bears a striking resemblance to another Stegosaurid named Kentrosaurus. The plates on their back were far less dynamic than Stegosaurus, but gradually faded into larger and pointed spikes. However, I do think it's worth noting that Alcovasaurus had much larger Thagomizer spikes than Stegosaurus, reaching up to 4 feet long at the largest. This seemed to imply that as opposed to Hesperosaurus, these guys were more geared towards defense rather than display. It's weird how things balance out like that sometimes. However, Stegosaurids were not the only Thyreoforans present in the Morrison. In fact, two species of Ankylosaurs were also here. Those would be Gargoyleosaurus and Memora Pelta, two Notosaurid Ankylosaurs. While they do share some distinct differences, they actually have a relatively similar body plan. They were both around the same size, reaching up to 3 meters or 10 feet in length. Unlike their incredibly famous cousins from the Cretaceous, Notosaurids like Gargoyleosaurus and Memora Pelta lack the tail club that make Ankylosaurus so famous. Instead, their armor more works sort of as a passive defense, providing shoulder spikes to protect them from being bitten. Many people seem to be of the misbelief that Ankylosaurs weren't around until the Cretaceous, but I'm here to tell you that that wasn't the case, as evidenced by these two. However, no matter what way you put it, the real star of the show here in the Morrison is none other than the sauropods. Sauropods are undoubtedly what the Morrison is the most famous for, with over 10 different unique species. The most famous of these sauropod groups is definitely a toss-up between two, but I'd give it to the Diplodocids. Diplodocus itself is definitely the most famous of these, with two unique species. The larger of the two, Diplodocus halorum, was once thought to be a separate species known as Seismosaurus, but this has since shown to be otherwise placing Diplodocus as one of the longest dinosaurs ever, reaching over 100 feet or 30 meters in length. Diplodocus and its relatives would have a much more limited feeding range than other sauropods that it shared territory with. Once again, this was likely an adaptation to reduce competition between so many different species, and their peg-like teeth would have made it much easier for them to eat soft plants like ferns. Other Diplodocids from this area include Apatosaurus, Brontosaurus, Supersaurus, and Barosaurus. Barosaurus and Supersaurus are actually a point of debate right now in paleontology. That's because of one specific specimen known as BYU9024. This specimen is a massive cervical vertebrae, but it's still debated whether it belongs to Barosaurus or Supersaurus. 
When it was originally discovered, it was classified under Barosaurus and was treated as such for many years. However, it seemed like some research from 2021 reclassified it as a specimen from Supersaurus. This is currently where the specimen stands, but it's still a huge point of debate, and where it could end up is still a mystery. Speaking of massive dinosaurs, many people seem to think that this animal, Amphicolius, was the longest dinosaur of all time. While that sounds incredibly intriguing, this is a largely baseless claim. The massive size is estimated for this animal, between 40 and 60 meters or 130 to 200 feet are not taken seriously by the scientific community. There are two major reasons for this, the first of which being that the fossil specimens were actually lost. On top of that, the field notes that claim that this specimen was over 9 feet tall are widely accepted to contain typographical errors and are likely only to be about half the size. However, the Morrison did have one valid Amphicolia species, reaching about 82 feet or 25 meters in length. Another group of sauropods, known as Dicreosaurids, also lived here in the Morrison. This group is only represented by three species, and they're all fairly fragmentary. These would be Smetanosaurus, Dislocosaurus, and Suwasia. Suwasia is the best known, estimated to reach about 15 meters or 50 feet in length. The Dicreosaurs had a very similar body plan to Diplodocus and its relatives, but likely had a much more flexible neck, allowing them to reach different vegetation. However, in the Morrison, another group of sauropods roamed that were likely even more famous than the Diplodocids, thanks to one of its most famous members. These are the Macronarian sauropods, which contain animals like Camarasaurus and Brachiosaurus. Instead of being incredibly long and stretched like a snake with a body, these guys were rather tall and stout. Their name, Macronarians, comes from their large nostrils, which are often bigger than their eyeballs. Many Macronarians, but especially Brachiosaurus, had longer front limbs, probably allowing them to reach higher vegetation. Their teeth are much thicker and more spoon-like, which would allow them to consume tougher material like the conifers. Brachiosaurus and its relatives were some of the most successful sauropods, eventually spawning what would become the Titanosaurian line. Many of you may know this, but the Titanosaurs were the most successful sauropods of the Cretaceous period that followed the Jurassic. Brachiosaurus and Camarasaurus may be the two most popular Macronarians from the Morrison, but a third species also existed here. This was Dystrophius, and it was once thought to be a fragmentary Diplodocid, but recent discoveries and studies shows that it was in fact a Macronarian. However, it's still fragmentary and partial, so not much more is known about it beyond that. And it really exemplifies just how diverse the sauropods became during this time. However, as history has shown us, few animals are more diverse than the theropod dinosaurs themselves. Theropods, of course, are the group of dinosaurs that include birds and most of the carnivorous dinosaurs. These predators were almost as diverse as their prey, making interesting relationships between both groups. In the Morrison, theropods can be broken into four major groups, the Megalosaurs, Ceratosaurs, Silurosaurs, and of course, the Allosaurs. The most diminutive of these animals would have been the Silurosaurs. Silurosaurs are small, leaf, and usually carnivorous. The most prominent among these in the Morrison were Silurus, Ornitholestes, and Tanicolagrius. These three are fairly basal Silurosaurs and are early representations of the group before they really began to expand during the Cretaceous. They're all very similar to one another, having a standard theropod body plan, but there are some notable differences. The most notable difference is that Tanicolagrius is significantly larger than both of the others, reaching almost double their size. Another Silurosaur, around the same size as Tanicolagrius, also lived here, but wasn't too closely related to the others. This was Stochiosaurus, an animal thought to be a primitive and early Tyrannosaur. They belonged to a group of animals known as Proceratosaurids, which were sort of like the early plans and experimentation on Tyrannosaurs. The last of the Silurosaurs in the Morrison belonged to two basal Troodontids, Coparion and Hesperornithoides. Unfortunately, only the latter represents decent fossil material, as Coparion is only known from a single isolated tooth from Utah. Hesperornithoides, however, would have been an incredibly small animal, only about 3 feet or 90 centimeters in length. These little troodontids were likely insectivorous, but may have served as prey on occasion themselves. While the Silurosaurs are not the dominant predators, they serve an important intermediary role by keeping the small animal numbers in check, much like foxes do today. However, this brings us to the more dominant and much larger predators of the Morrison, starting with the Ceratosaurs. There are two possible Ceratosaurids in the Morrison, one being Ceratosaurus itself, and one being the lesser-known Fostero Venator. However, the reason Fostero Venator remains unknown is because it's a fairly fragmentary fossil, and its placement within the Ceratosaurid group remains uncertain. 
Ceratosaurus itself is a very often misrepresented dinosaur. It is often shown being hunted and outclassed by its competitor, the Allosaurus. However, due to niche partitioning, competition between these two species might be far less common than we thought. Ceratosaurus fossils are incredibly rare in comparison to Allosaurus, suggesting that they weren't as successful. While Ceratosaurus is fairly large, they wouldn't have been large enough to directly compete with most of the top predators. Ceratosaurus has extremely long teeth, with a long snout and skull as well. It's likely that these adaptations would allow Ceratosaurus to eat different parts of the body than its competitors, thereby reducing competition. Those incredibly long teeth and that snout would be perfect for inner body organs. There is also speculation that Ceratosaurus may have been capable of hunting aquatic prey, such as the lungfish Ceratodus, but there is little proof to back this up, so it is kind of merely speculation for the moment. What we do know is that Ceratosaurus managed to reduce its competition and make a living for themselves in a relatively cruel world. A powerful and well-built group of theropods are none other than the Megalosaurids. These animals were large and stockily built, and they had more powerful skulls than most of the animals they shared territory with. Only two Megalosaurids have been found in the Morrison, the smaller of which, Marshosaurus, was around 4.5 meters or 15 feet in length and weighing around 440 pounds or about 200 kilograms. Marshosaurus was a relatively large predator and likely served the same niche as Ceratosaurus, but was able to take on heavier prey. The larger of the two Megalosaurids would have been one of the Morrison's top predators. This creature is none other than Torvosaurus. These brutish theropods reached up to 30 feet or 9 meters in length and weighed more than 2 tons. This puts them at one of the top positions in the Morrison, one of the only animals that can compete with Allosaurus directly. However, Torvosaurus, just like Ceratosaurus, is far less common than its competitor, once again thought to be because of niche partitioning. Where Ceratosaurus is thought to eat the internal organs, Torvosaurus is thought to have focused on the outer layer of meat as well as the bones. That being said, it was definitely one of the only theropods that could actually compete with Allosaurus and may have occasionally contested it for food. There have been claims in the past that Torvosaurus could reach much larger sizes in the Morrison. This is largely due to finds of animals like Edmarca rex. Many folks in the past have claimed this to belong to Torvosaurus, which would make this animal reach up to 40 feet in length. However, those claims are unfounded, as the Edmarca rex specimen has never gone through a detailed analysis, so it can't just be assigned to Torvosaurus, making them the third largest predator here in the Morrison. However, the top predator of the Morrison is undoubtedly and unequivocally the Allosaurus. These are by far the most common predators in the Morrison, comprising over 70% of all theropod specimens found in this location. This makes Allosaurus the dominant predator of the Jurassic, and they had several traits that allowed them to be such. Allosaurus has incredibly long legs compared to most of its contemporaries, and it's assumed that they hunted in more open floodplains and savanna rather than the thick forest where smaller predators could shine. There were two distinct species in the Morrison, with the larger one reaching up to 32 feet or 9.7 meters in length and weighing around 3 tons. Their relatively lightweight build plus their size would have allowed Allosaurus to be much faster than most other large theropods. They also have long and powerful arms equipped with dagger-like claws that would have been perfect for grasping and holding on to prey. It's thought that Allosaurus would run down their prey, grasp on with their arms and claws, and then bite several times against their neck, similar to a big cat. On top of that, they were able to open their jaws incredibly wide and move its head and neck relatively rapidly, which would in turn allow them to make a rapid series of quick bites. These traits allowed Allosaurus to tackle the largest prey the Morrison had to offer, with evidence of attacks on stegosaurs and sauropods alike. However, when it comes to sauropods, Allosaurus may have had to scavenge, as the very largest would have been near impossible to take down single-handedly. There are many theories out there that Allosaurus would have teamed up as a group to hunt animals such as sauropods, but that might not actually be the case. While there are several fossil sites with multiple specimens of Allosaurus, this may be a factor of mob mentality. Today, when animals like Komodo dragons and crocodilians find a sick or wounded animal, they essentially jump them. And usually the sheer number of predators is too much for the animal, and they'll die from just the stress of the situation. However, these are never organized attacks, and again, it's usually just a case of mob mentality. Usually at these locations, larger animals will be far more aggressive and dominant over kills, and kill smaller animals who attempt to eat first. It's thought that Allosaurus' pack hunting behavior may have mimicked this, which would explain why there's such a high number of young Allosaurus at these congregated feeding sites. Regardless, there is no debate that Allosaurus is at the top of the trophic level for the Morrison, outside or inside of these congregated feeding sites. However, the Morrison still has one last surprise to offer. 
This animal in the past has often been interpreted as a very large allosaurus, but is recently found to be another species entirely. This is Sorophaganax, the largest predator within the Morrison Formation. These massive predators can reach over 10 meters long, about 34 feet, and weigh nearly 4 tons. The major difference from Allosaurus is that Sorophaganax has far more robust chevrons, the bones that allow for muscle attachments on the tail. This would have given them a far better center of gravity, but also make them much slower and heavier in comparison to Allosaurus. While it is thought that they were fairly active predators, they may have had to rely on ambush far more than Allosaurus because of their extra weight. Just like Torvosaurus and Ceratosaurus, Sorophaganax is far less common than its smaller relative. This could be due to niche partitioning, but it could also just be due to Sorophaganax being less successful than their cousins. Size can definitely be useful, but when it comes to dinosaurs, it's not everything. As you can see, the Morrison Formation was a complex and rich source of life during the Jurassic period, and that's just what we've discovered. Imagine how much is still out there just waiting for us to find. The species, animals, specimens, all currently lost to history and time. Yet, those specimens that we have found continue to inspire us to this day. They bring us passion and inspiration and love for the natural world, both past and present. And I, for one, am extremely excited to learn more. I sincerely hope you enjoyed, and thank you all so very much for watching. This video was by far one of my favorites to make, so I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and I'll probably do other videos similar to this in the future if you all enjoy it. Are there any other formations or locations that you guys would like to see? Let me know in the comments below. Once again, thank you all so very much for watching. Remember to be good people, and I'll see you guys in the next one.